they use the traditional tools in the place to kind of build the place. And if you ever want to know where the center of town is, the center of town is always at Life Mason. <laughs> and sometimes you get people asking you for your autograph randomly just because you have people from the city. So that is what I love about Oaxaca. I love the rain. I love that it's raining and it's 85 degrees, so I don't feel like I have to put up my umbrella, but it brings you nice and beautiful, lush plants. All right. Hey, guys. Welcome to Expat Your Life. My name is Abram, as your host, coming to you as always. Uh, today we are doing something a little different. We are not filming in in person. Uh, I am filming kind of online, so bear with me. This is my first time doing this. Please be careful and just have fun with it. All right. So today's guest is Suki. How are you? Hi, Suki. How are you? I'm good. No complaints. Excellent. Excellent. Suki, uh, just for everyone out there, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and where you're at. Okay, um, I'm in Oaxaca, Mexico. Uh, my name is Suki, as I mentioned. I'm here with my husband and my youngest son. My oldest daughter is also in Oaxaca, but she's living on her own in Oaxaca. And then my middle child is in college right now. Um, and, you know, I'm, I guess I'm in Oaxaca living my best life. So I'm doing a thousand things that we'll probably talk about as the time progresses forward. Um, but what I'm working on right this moment in Oaxaca is I'm actually building out a co-working, co-living space. So oh. I'm not just living in Oaxaca, I'm you know, growing within Oaxaca, if you will. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so Oaxaca is your home base. How long have you been living there? I've been here for, it's gonna be 10 months. Um, before here, I had been in various countries. So I would do about six months in different countries since 2012. Um, and we got to the point, my husband and I, where we realized the little one had been traveling with us a lot, that he needed someplace steady. So we were, as we were going through the different countries, we were actually looking for what the new home base was gonna be. Um, Oaxaca was not the plan for the home base. So Oaxaca was a completely happy accident. But once we got off the plane and we were here two days, we knew that this checked off all the boxes. And so here we are. Oh, that's, that's a happy story. Um... And then, like, so you've been there since 2000, and, or you've been traveling since 2012. Uh, yes. Have, have the, the traveling part, have you been abroad the whole time, or did you spend, a, you know, extended periods of time back in your home country? I would spend extended periods back in the home country. Um, for various reasons, I needed to be physically in the United States for more than 183 days a year. So I, I believe in following the rules, so I did do that. So I spent probably 184 days, and then uh, the rest of the time we spent out. Uh, so it sounds like you've got some amazing stories. Can you maybe like list off all the places that you've been? Yes, uh, so we've been Ecuador, Colombia, several cities in Panama, Grenada, Costa Rica, I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting somebody. Oh, and obviously Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's it. Oh, Ecuador, that was our first stop. Um, so 2012 was when we started the journey, like I mentioned, and it was a, it was a real unknown. The, now we have forums and YouTube and all this stuff. There was just nothing going on back then. So it was a very, let's just do it type of feel. Um, at the time, we started homeschooling our son, and we definitely started feeling like we needed time to um, mentally clear our minds, and we needed to do that out of the country. And so it was just, it was a very happenstance, you know, Ecuador. Once we did that, you know, the bug, you know, we got bit by the bug. It was, wait a minute, you know, we've been working online at a time where people weren't doing it like they're doing it now. So it was a time where my mother was still like, when are you going to get a real job? You know, and, and it just didn't make sense to her at all. But we were working and we were kind of like, well, we're both working online anyway. We can be anywhere and we can start to expand our worldview. Um, so Ecuador was pretty transformative. Um, because it was, it was, you know, we got there and we did not recognize, I think sometimes um, the heaviness that we were experiencing in the States and it was just kind of gone. Um, and it was good, you know, it was, it was a sense of freedom that we hadn't really realized we weren't feeling. 
And so from that point, we made the commitment that we were probably going to move abroad. I mean, especially for the, the third son, we knew we wanted to raise him abroad. So at that point, we moved from just visiting a place to we need to explore where it's going to be our home base. And we were going to give ourselves several years to do that. Okay. Okay. And that sounds like an amazing adventure. Now, um, you obviously you have a family with you and that that differs a little bit from other people, actually not a little bit, a lot from a lot of other people that I've had so far on the show. Can you like describe to me or like tell me like what what differences do you think you'll see traveling with your family versus? Well, I think, um, so with the first, I just, I guess I don't know because we've always traveled, you know, it's one of those things I've always looked at the kids like, you know, I go, you go. So it was very much pack your bags. We're headed out, you know, and they were like, what? <laughs> you know, what are you doing? And, you know, so we just, I don't know, we just did it. I don't, I can't say I know what the differences are because we've, we've had kids a long time. My oldest is 25. Okay. And the youngest is seven. So we've, we've had kids literally our entire adult lives. So we've always just incorporated them as part of the process. Um, so I, I just don't know what the differences would be. I guess there's, and there's certain things that I don't do anyway as a normal matter, right? Um, I don't go to, especially not in another country, nightclubs, mm-hmm. you know, I don't stay out. You know, I definitely don't walk the streets late or anything like that. So I think the things that they tell you to do safety wise, I do naturally because I have the kids with me. Um, And I've found, which has been such a pleasure traveling with them, you know, in the United States, kids are very like separated. They have to go to daycare and da da da. When we started going to Ecuador and the other countries, I I was like, these people are fantastic. I would go into the restaurant and the kid was right there. And there was never a place that I went where anyone ever looked at us like, what are you doing with this kid here? Like they have no problem with the kids being there with you. I went to a rooftop party the other day I think it was like a techno rooftop party. And surely my son was the only kid there. And he's dancing to the DJ. Everybody else is dancing. And it was no problem. Um, so I don't even know if there's a difference. The, the, I can tell you the kids have not been a hindrance. Because okay. no one has acted like, oh, there's a problem with a kid being here. Okay. So it, it, for them, it's even a more free. They get to experience things that they wouldn't experience back in, back in the States. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's fantastic. Now, let's kind of uh, go in. You know, you said you've been abroad for 12 years now, uh, or since 2012. um, And, uh, you know, obviously there's something that probably kicked that off in the beginning. Did you travel a lot before 2012? Um, Not abroad, no. So I can't say that we did. That was the first time. Um, At the time, we were, you know, we did the American dream, if you will. So we did all of it. We got the nice house and the good neighborhood. And we, you know, we thought, you know, this is it. You know, we've we've reached the pinnacle. And I think what it was for us was we started to understand. So my husband and I are both first generation Haitian Americans. Okay. And in raising our kids, we did not understand at first, and we were young, how much community matters and how much what's around them matters. So we had, you know, we used to joke it's Haiti in our house and it might've been, but they were still going out to different cultural ideas um, and small things about respecting your parents. And, you know, we we found we were fighting about things that we would say, you know, this is, there's no point to this, but from the kids' point of view, which I could understand, they didn't see anything else. What, What they saw was normal. So what I was calling abnormal was normal in their world. And there was nothing supporting me. TV was definitely not supporting me. So I didn't even let them watch TV. The school was not supportive. And I found particularly with my son, I had to get into battles that I didn't have to get into with my daughter, which really annoyed me to no end. I had to battle to get him into gifted programs. I had to, you know, I was constantly battling and I got to the point where I was like, you know, I don't know why I'm doing this much fighting because I'm not asking for anything ridiculous. I'm saying we want to get the most out of the education. This should not be a fight. You should be looking at me and saying, let's do this. But the fact that I'm constantly battling and then worrying and same thing, I worried about my daughter, obviously. I worried about my son a whole lot more. Um, He's, well now I think he's 6'3", 220. So he's a big guy. Even then, back around seventh grade, he was just bigger than everyone. 
And even though he's, he's actually, he's a pacifist, like 100%. He's the non, most non-aggressive person you'll ever meet. But they were sometimes at school talking to me as though he was real aggressive. And I know him, right? He's, he's not that guy. And I started thinking to myself, I cannot have other people put something on him that's not real. I need him to be able to be a teenager and be mentally free. You know, there, there's got, you've got to be free at some point in your life. And so that was kind of our gift to him to go places and be free and not have all this extra thoughts kind of going on in your mind. So that was really the catalyst. It was, you know, we pulled him out of school. We started homeschooling and we said, you know, the world will be your school. And that's what we did. Uh, so the motivation to get out was just to kind of be a lot freer for yourself and for your family. So I completely agree with that. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure a lot of other people can too. Okay, uh, so let's move on to pros and cons. Um, you know, everyone who's thinking about moving abroad has their different, you know, mindsets and they weigh the pros versus the cons. Um, let's start off on the positive note. Let's go with the pros. What are, what are some of the pros of living abroad? Well, depending on the country that you choose, the finances, um, you can live you can decide that you wanna live a little bit more frugally and you can really save. You can decide you're gonna take the same amount of money that you've made and live off of that money and live three, four, five times. You know, And I say better loosely, um, particularly as a woman. The one thing as a black woman, I think particularly self-care is something that we tend to neglect, especially when you're young and you have kids and what have you. And it wasn't until I moved abroad that I started okay, I need to go for the massage, right? I need to go for the walk because I just didn't have time before between doing the stuff for the kids and taking the house and working, et cetera. So for me, that's one of the biggest pros of moving abroad. I love learn. I love language in and of itself. So um, I love learning the different Spanishes in the different countries and learning what they say in this country versus that country. Um, so for me, that's a great pro. Um, there's just so much, like the whole thing is fantastic, right? I, I can choose, you know what it is, the big pro? It's the choice. You know, the whole world is kind of open to you. And so you can really put together a checklist. You don't like this kind of weather? No problem, that place is off. You know, you need high-speed internet? No problem, that space is off. So your ability to have choices is great. And I'll tell you one of the biggest pros, furnished places. This is not a thing in the U.S., right? It just doesn't happen. So you come to all these countries, the place is furnished, they tell you utilities are included. You don't have to think about who the electric person is, where the water's coming from. It just magically appears. That saves a solid weekly, probably an hour or two of your time in terms of maintenance. Um, so in a very way, people are always kind of like taking care of you. And now that you've got all these Facebook groups and all of that, you've got a lot of resources for what to do and what not to do before you go. So this is actually the best time. He said, when we went in 2012, it was a, I will tell you about that story, total free for all. We ended up in a gangster neighborhood in Ecuador. Um, but now, you know, everybody tells you, these are the neighborhoods, this is where you wanna go. This is what you wanna look out for. So I think this is one of the best times to do it because there's so much information, so many people willing to talk that it, even the cons now, probably aren't cons as much as they were before because now you have more pros. Okay, okay. Yeah, so those are the pros, um, you know, and, and even myself moving abroad, I would 100% agree with what you said. You know, finding furnished places saves a lot of headache. Uh, you get a better, better quality of life uh, by being abroad as well. So that's, that's, that's great. So now let's, let's reverse that, flip it on its head. Let's go straight into the cons. All right, so I'm gonna give you the same furnished place cons. So everyone has a different perception of what it means for you to be in a property and property manager. So it, maybe this is me complaining to you, so shame on me. So where, where I am, everything's paid for, but if, if something goes wrong, like if they have to fix in the plumber or whatever, I've been waiting for the plumber since nine o'clock today. So I have to wait for like the people and they don't, and even though I say, look, can you send me a message? Just tell me. You know what? It just doesn't happen like that. My doorbell just rings and it's like, oh, it's the plumber. 
And there's no thought of maybe I might be doing something, right? So what I consider to be a norm in terms of, you know, letting people know, it's just not. So I think some of the, one of the biggest cons is you really need to understand the norms of where you are. Um, I'm a veteran now at the whole, you know, late thing. So, I, you know, you, you have to be like two hours late before I really start saying what happened. But when I first started going abroad, you know, it'd be five, 10 minutes, the cable person wouldn't come. And I'd call back and they weren't even embarrassed. You know, it was like, yeah, manana, you know, I'm like, really, you know, like, so manana doesn't even mean tomorrow. It means at some point I'll get to you. So that's definitely, um, I would say a learning curve. I think as well, um, the cons are going to be very related to where you are specifically and the type of person you are. So I'm very adaptable. There's very little that bothers me. So, you know, for the most part, I'm just kind of a very go with the flow. But I think for someone who is used to, you know, things a certain way or who comes in thinking there's a standard that has to be met, you know, it's going to end up being, being a problem. You're going to see things that you've never seen. I've seen bugs that I have never seen before in my life, all different shapes and, and sizes, and you just kind of have to get, you know, used to it. I would say another a big con for me, and this is very particular to me, so I have these, I take whole food vitamins. So like either liquid, but something made from food. And I cannot get it shipped to me anywhere. They, they just, the country just won't take it. And I've tried it everywhere. I've shipped stuff to my stuff in Grenada, in Colombia. It doesn't even matter. The governments will typically stop it at customs or in the case of Grenada, they absolutely gouged me. When I sent my stuff over, I show up to pick up my stuff and they tell me I've got to pay $200 to get my stuff that I'm looking at right behind the guy. I only paid $100 for the stuff in the first place. So you really have to kind of plan and pay attention to if you need something, you know, clothes don't really need to, you know, for me, I don't really pack clothes. I have a couple of things that I'm going to buy when I get there, but things like vitamins, you know, things that you know you can't get in the country and that pro and you don't know if it's going to make it past customs, you just want to bring that stuff with you because it's it's a real blow when you kind of rely on it and you just don't have it. So, you know, going along with pros and cons, um, let's talk stories. Uh, can you tell us, you know, like your best experience that you've had while living abroad? Like the one, the one experience that stands out in your mind. Okay. Um, I had so many, so we'll just have to stick to one. So I'll, I'll go through the one where the feel. So there was, um, you know, I have no idea. My son was angry about something. I'm sure I said something and annoyed him. I was like, well, you're going to have to go because I don't have time for whatever you're feeling. And we're in Panama. And, you know, I sent him to go sit on the porch. He stay he decides he wants to go pacing the streets and he looks crazy right he's not even wearing a shirt I mean he just looks out of control so I see him I'm like whatever it's not my problem the next day we go we're driving and we pass by the police checkpoint and the police says to me oh I saw your son yesterday he was exercising and we'd asked him if he had ID but he didn't and we just told him you know make sure you have your ID so you know we just wanted to let you know he can exercise whatever no big deal just have ID and I have to tell you this was early in our travels the feeling of joy that came over me was probably ridiculous, right? He started to talk to me about my son and everything started going through my mind. I was already apologizing in my head, saying he's okay. You know, because I saw his face on the way out there. He really looked crazy. I mean, he was, he was pacing like a madman. And we passed by and all I thought was, wow, you know, they saw him as exercising. Even though he's out there, no shirt, pacing the street late at night. And he's just, and for them, he was exercising. And that was my best experience because I, that was the moment I really felt like I can actually be free. So when he called me, sometimes, you know, he took the wrong bus and he would call me from a restaurant or something. I never felt like, oh my gosh, I've got to cut me right. You know, I never felt that way. It was, okay, give me your address. I'm on my way. And I never rushed or anything. So that for me was the best. And there's a thousand. I mean, I have to say every day is my best experience abroad. But that was probably the best um, because it just, it, it totally gave me a sense of, yes, he can be seen as a person. And the fact that his humanity was seen first was just incredible for me. Wow, that's, that's, that is an uh, awesome story. Um, and I bet it even puts, as a mother, it puts you at ease now saying that, seeing that he can go out and be on the street late at night and you're just like, oh, 
Yeah. Yeah. The worst I'm like is make sure you get here on time. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, the food will be in the oven if, if you're late. <laughs> if you're late, the food won't even be there. It'll be in the refrigerator, so you're on your own. <laughs> All right, so now let, let's, let's go and go to the dark side. And uh, tell us the worst experience that you've had in the, the almost 10 years that you've lived abroad. Worst experience. Oh, I know the worst experience. I've had a couple of them, but this one was, was outrageous. So we were in Costa Rica. And we were staying at a resort, not a resort, but like, I don't, it was a small town, you know, and we were doing a, a border run basically from Panama to Costa Rica. So the whole, the whole thing was just from the beginning. We try to get to the border on one bus. We try to go to the smaller border so we can get through it faster. We get to the border and it's closed because they don't have electricity. So I'm like, okay, so now we've got to take another two hours to the other border in this, you know, in a very suspicious van that is, you know, we're going in this van and we're packed at the border. So I'm saying to myself, we can't possibly take more people, right? Well, anyway, I was wrong. I mean, they're just packing people on this bus, people on the top of me, but you know, we make it, we, we live, no problem. So we make it through the border and we take a taxi up to the place. So I'm in the taxi and I'm looking down at cliffs. There's no side rails, there's nothing. So I say, you know, you know, can you share me where the seatbelts are? So he starts laughing at me and he says, you know, if we fall down the mountain, we're dying anyway. So, okay, that's great. But that was a sign of things to come. We finally make it to the, you know, the hotel. We go into the town. We get into the town. We're there about two, three minutes and we're stopped by the police. So the police start accusing us of being drug runners from Cuba. So, you know, my husband, he's good. He's calm, cute, you know, cool as a cucumber. Me, I'm like, oh my gosh, do they need me to bribe them? Do I know a lawyer? I got to call my mom. So I'm going through all the things. They ran us through Interpol and the whole time they kept saying, so where in Cuba are you from? You know, what have you? And my husband kept saying, I've never been, you know, this is my name. And he, he was just calm as can be, but they had us basically held up on the street for like an hour and a half. And it's just us, the family standing there with surrounded by police. So we looked like criminals. Um, so that was, that was probably the worst because I'd never, I, you know, I never had an experience like that before. And it was very scary because I usually have a plan for, okay, who would I call or things like that? And I didn't. So that's probably what scared me more. I didn't have in the back of my mind, okay, this is the action I would take if we happen to be arrested in a foreign country for doing something we didn't do, but I don't even know, I didn't even know the rules at the time. So I've changed my ways. I always, I check the rules and everything now, but at the time that wasn't on my list. So I didn't even know what the rules were. If they arrest us, you know, can we call the embassy? Can we not? Uh, so that was it. That was the, the worst because of the unknown. And I, you know, I've never been accused of being a drug runner before. So that was a new kind of not so happy experience for me. So needless to say, we crossed Costa Rica off our list because um, yeah. We just took it as a sign that from the beginning to the end, it was nothing good. So we definitely paid attention to the signs and the signs said that wasn't the right country for us. Not that it's not a good country for anyone who's in Costa Rica. I mean, I don't want to deter anyone. It was a very small town. It wasn't the city, um, but it was, it was definitely scary. I can imagine. I can imagine an interaction like that where they're already accusing you and they've made up their mind uh, for something can go one or two ways, but it sounds like your husband handled it like, like a pro. The pro. I mean, he was so calm. I'm looking at him. I'm like, wow, you know, he's, a, he's, a, he's so professional at this. He was calm. He just kept saying, you know, yes, absolutely. Run my paperwork. And me, I'm looking and I'm thinking, who runs drugs with their kids anyway? Right? Like, like we're, we're here with the whole family. Do they really do that? Yeah. And maybe people do. Um, I just, you know, I guess I don't have that much experience, but he, he was good because I was definitely in panic mode. And you know, I was ready, whatever, you know, they could have been like, hey, I need $300. I'm like, oh, let's go to the ATM. So really whatever they needed, it was happening. Now, looking back on it though, would you say like on, on a scale of one to 10, how bad do you think that was, that encounter was after you'd walked away from that encounter? Pretty bad because I've been in various countries and I've interacted with police in every single one of them. Um, they're like my go-to for if I can't find a place. So I'd never felt in any other country that they weren't there if I needed them. Mm -hmm. So it stands out still as pretty bad because 
I've just not had, you know, that experience. So I've been, you know, they've got the big guns and what have you. If I say Buenos Aires, they say Buenos Aires back. You know, I've just, I've sometimes I've not often, but you know, if I go out and if I don't happen to have my paperwork on me and they'll ask me and I'll say, you know, I'm sorry, I forgot at home. And they're like, okay, have it next time. You know, so it still actually stands out because I've not in all of the different countries in all the years, that's never happened. Okay. With, With you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Understandable. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I should say they were still nice about it I mean even though we were being accused it wasn't like you know angry it was very I don't know if you ever watched that show um when the airports where they go and I forget what they call it they could they had so in Spanish they love it um it's like airport wars or whatever and people run drugs and then they bring him into the room and the guy's real calm you know ma'am you had 70 k's of cocaine and he's very nice so even though he's accusing her it's a very nice tone so I don't want to say that it wasn't an angry or negative or demeaning in any way they were still very respectful in the accusation. So there was nothing aggressive going on, but it was still the accusation that, that got me. Pros and cons were those, and the stories that you had were amazing. Uh, I kind of want to change gears real quick. And I want to, to jump into when you were initially making the move uh, and uh, kind of talk about that a little bit. Uh, I bet you told your friends, your family, and, and everyone, hey, I'm leaving. You were probably super excited and, and decided to leave. Were, what were their, their reactions when you, when you finally told them that you were going to move? So the opposite is true. We told no one because we already knew um, that our mothers, they, there was just no way that they were going to be able to handle that. So the first few times, um, they, they were used to us living online. Our family is mostly in New York anyway, so they weren't, you know, necessarily used to seeing us. Um, so it was kind of no big deal the first few years. When we started spending more time abroad, same thing. We never, we never told anyone when we're getting on the plane and heading over because that's just too much talk and we just don't have time for that. When we got there, we would tell them. And I, you know, I mean, the, both our mothers were just like, oh, you know, what are you doing? You know, and it was a range of, you know, you're doing this with kids. So part of the reason we'd wait, we'd wait to be there about a month. And then we'd call and we'd say, oh, you know, I'm in Colombia or I'm in Panama. And then they'd be like, oh my God, you know, you're going to die. And then we'd be like, well, we've been here a month and we're still alive. So just, you know, just to give you a, a sense. And I actually invited my mother out to stay with us in Colombia. Even that was, that was an experience. I mean, she was like, you know, deathly afraid. Like I had to send her the plane ticket and just be like, look, if I don't see you, you know, this is going to be a thing. I'm going to need you to do this. And then she lands and we're there, I don't know, two days. She suddenly starts talking to me about buying a condo there and it's great. And I was like, okay, you know, and now and we've been doing it for a while. So I guess they're desensitized. They're, you know, I'm watching my father on Facebook post about how he's coming to Mexico for three months they had told me a couple of weeks, so I'm, I'm really trying to understand what this three months thing is about exactly. But they've changed over the years, probably because we've desensitized them. Um, because at first, it was definitely, you know, what are they doing? We probably, we've always been the outliers, if you will, in both our families. So they, you know, moving abroad was probably a little bit extra from what they've seen us do. But we were working remote. You know, like I said, before it was a thing. So they already thought we were a little off anyway. We moved to the middle of Pennsylvania, you know, to buy a house. And they thought, you know, who does that? So we've been doing things for a while where they thought, you know, what are they crazy? And so by the time, you know, the moving happened, they were fine. But I have to tell you for the people watching this and who haven't started their journey yet, we are eight years later. And my mother tells me all the time, that this is the best thing that we could have done. She's so happy that her grandson is being raised in an international setting and we were so smart to make the move. So it's taken time. So you might be at the beginning where the people are saying you're crazy and all of that, but I'm closer to, you know, further along and everyone around me is very, how can we do it too? They want to come to where we are. They want to, you know, they want help to do it. And I think things have changed as well. Now that there are channels like yours where people can see, you know, actually, actual people living abroad. I think the mindset is changing a little bit. 
Uh, so now on your end, it sounds like you've done you you and your husband did this together. Uh, you had a first step that you needed to take in order to make the move abroad. What was that first step? Our first step has been had gone on for years. You know, I know some people kind of just get up and go, and I'm just not a get up and go person. I'm very much a planner. The first step was understanding that I don't know, I didn't know at the time anyway, where my final stop was going to be. So I didn't act like I knew, like I knew I'm going for a set period of time. And so I didn't try to get into the life stuff, getting residency and paperwork and yada, yada, because I just didn't know. So the first step was absolutely, and I would say the first step is exploration, but even that's not exactly true. For four years before 2012, we had been organizing our lives in a way where we could work from anywhere. So we spent four years mapping that out and committing to each other and to ourselves that we were going to work remotely. So that, that was absolute first step number one. Then step number two was understanding we are going, we are in exploration mode. So certain things we're not going to get, you know, involved in because we know we're in exploration. Then the logistics started happening. And I'm, I'm a big fan of logistics and just understanding the rules and the laws, et cetera. There are some countries where if you stay, Colombia being one of them, if you stay more than 182 days physically in that country, you become a tax resident. So I started checking on things like, you know, tax consequences, what the visas mean, what the, what the general laws are as they apply to me as a foreigner and people who were there. So I would do a lot of homework before I showed up any place. And then, you know, I would, I would go and know that I would make my decision only from being there. So I never made a decision about staying someplace without actually going. You know, I, I see sometimes people, you know, they selling everything is actually okay because you need to be kind of free to go, you know, all the different places. Um, but getting into, when you first get into a place, into a year lease or things like that, if it can be avoided, I say you should avoid it because you just don't know what's going to speak to you and you need that time to understand yourself outside of the States and then the place. And that I think is the most important thing. You don't know who you are abroad and you're not going to know who you are abroad until you actually get there. So you've got to discover that person first. And then once you discover that person, now you can start making your decisions about where you want to go and where you want to be. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's a that's a great piece of advice because uh, a lot of people don't know to even think about that. Uh, and you know, it, it takes the experience of going to multiple places like you've done uh, in order to gain it. So that's something that Bill, that someone who's thinking about making that move can can now use as a uh, as for themselves. So, oh, excellent, excellent. So, you know, you've done this, you also yourself have been inspiring people. Um, outside of what we just discussed, is there the one piece of advice that you'd give to a friend or a family member or even a stranger that's, that has, hey, I wanna move abroad, how do I do this? Uh, what would be your one piece of advice for them? For them? I would say you need to be adaptable. You know, that, that's, that's really the one piece of advice. Do not go anywhere else attempting to recreate America or wherever you're from. So if you happen to be from America, UK, whatever it is, do not go someplace else trying to recreate that. Um, you know, allow the culture wherever you are to be itself. What it, what attracted you and what it offered you is what you weren't there for. So to go to a different place and want to recreate kind of an enclave of where you're, you know, originally from is not gonna allow you to experience the richness of the place. So get uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, the more uncomfortable you are, the better experience that you have. Be uncomfortable. Just start speaking whatever the language is. Don't worry about you know, your accent or anything like that. Most people are very nice. The whole world is my teacher. All day long, I say, how do you say this? How do you say that? And just give the experience its full due. Don't go halfway. You know, don't, don't leave and just wanna be in a different climate but the same thing you just came from. Let's kind of talk about what you're doing in Oaxaca. You said you've been there for 10 months. What projects and what are you doing with your, uh, with your life and everything there? Okay. Um, so while I'm still working because 
true Caribbean nature that never stops. <laughs> um, I also, I did see a need and I'm very information driven. Um, I do think that when people come, especially when you're exploring a place, you know, we would take four to six months, but some people don't have that kind of time as they're going through their journey. And I just felt like it was important for at least people who are coming to Oaxaca to give them a jump start. So I created, and I, I sent you a copy, the Oaxaca Living Guide, where it's in English and Spanish, and it has links to kind of the major things. And sometimes you just want to get stuff done, right? The dentist is $25. You might as well go and, you know, get your teeth cleaned and have them take a look at it and that kind of thing, the internist, acupuncturist. But it takes time to find all those things. So I created the guide for someone who just comes and they figure they're in exploration mode. They're here for a month or two so they can quickly kind of find what they need to find and get the most value out of Oaxaca. And then the project that I mentioned to you we're working on, La Soleil, um, it translates into the sun, essentially. It is a co-working, co-living space. So same thing, short-term housing for people in exploration mode. So I kind of want to be like the, you know, underground railroad type of, in a way of this is one of your stops. And so we're renovating completely with the explorer in mind. You know, you've got a, a base to come to. You've got the guide there. We obviously speak English. There'll be people there who speak Spanish and really give people the opportunity to decide if Oaxaca is right for them and or some people are coming here because they know Oaxaca is right for them, but you do not want to, so I'm so against signing a lease sight unseen, I, you know, that's like my, I'm, I'm like total no. So we wanted a place for, again, somebody can come for a month, you go around, visit the different neighborhoods, you, you know, you check, I have a checklist for apartments, check that hot water. I even open up the toilet bowl to look at the water inside, because that's going to tell me what the water is like coming out. So I had a whole checklist on what you need to check for in apartments. But if you're in a rush and you're trying to leave the hotel space, you're just gonna sign because you're so hot to get out. Um, and the co-working part obviously is because, you know, and, and some people look for jobs where they try to go. I'd say 95% of the people I come across have some kind of online employment, you know, in order to fund their dream. And so, and I've been there kind of working out of your bedroom all the time. Um, you get to the point where you're like, man, I just like to, I'd like to just go into a little office or something. I'd like to get out of my bedroom. So that is what the co-living, the co-working space is specifically for the travelers who just want a secondary space to work. Uh, so that's what we're working on. It's just really being that, that transitionary hub to make it a lot easier if, you know, and I love Oaxaca, so I'm, I'm totally prejudiced. So I can't even, I can't even speak objectively about it. But, you know, obviously people should make their own decision and be able to go to a place where they can get the full value and then compare it to other places. So in my ideal world, because I do actually know some different people doing similar things in other cities in Mexico, I'd love for us to create kind of um, a link between all of us where someone says, you know, I want to explore different cities in Mexico for six months. And then they kind of go around to each one of the places each month and then decide what works for them. So that's my ideal. Um.